Good morning. morning. Welcome you as we gather to give praise and lift up our prayers to our loving God. Uh, don't really have anything special. Oh, one thing. In the corner in the back is a table that has mugs and plates from our 125th anniversary. Anybody would like to have one or two, feel free to take them. Uh, once we moved back things into the parish hall, we found there were two big boxes of plates and two boxes of mugs. So there's a lot to share if anybody would like to take one. We continue our worship then by our singing our opening hymn. Today your mercy calls us. It is number 915. <laughs> We 
God in his mercy has given his son to die for you and for his sake forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We continue with the end. The Lord has made known his salvation. He has revealed his righteousness in the sight of the nations. Let the sea roar and all that fills it. The world that knows who dwell in it. Let the rivers clap their hands. Let the hills sing for joy together before the Lord. For he comes to judge the earth. He will judge the world with righteousness. And the peoples with equity. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. The Lord has made known his salvation. He has revealed his righteousness in the sight of the nations. Then you will live and in peace. 
And the Lord your God will bless you in the land that you are entering to possess. But if your heart turns away and you are not obedient, and if you are drawn away to bow down to other gods and worship them, I declare to you this day that you will certainly be destroyed. You will not live long in the land you are crossing the Jordan to enter and possess. This day I call heaven and earth as witnesses against you, that I have set before you life and death, blessings and curses. Now choose life, so that you and your children may live, and that you may love the Lord your God, listen to his voice, and hold fast to him. For the Lord is your life. And he will give you many years of the land he swore to give to your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The epistle reading is recorded by the Apostle Paul in his first letter to the Corinthians, chapter 3. Brothers, I could not address you as spiritual but as worldly, mere infants in Christ. I gave you milk, not solid food, for you were not yet ready for it. Indeed, you are still not ready. You are still worldly, for since there is jealousy and quarreling among you, are you not worldly? Are you not acting like mere men? For when one says, I follow Paul, and another, I follow Apollos. Are you not mere men? What after this, or after all, is Apollos? And what is Paul? Only servants through whom you came to believe, as the Lord has assigned to each his task. I planted the seed, Apollos watered it, but God gave it growth. So neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything, but only God who makes things grow. The man who plants and the man who waters have one purpose, and each will be rewarded according to his own labor. For we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field, God's building. This is the singing the gospel acclamation, I invite you to please stand. Last penny. 
You have heard that it was said, do not commit adultery. But I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you sin, gouge it out and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for the whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to go into hell. It has been said, anyone who divorces his wife must give her a certificate of divorce. But I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife, except for marital unfaithfulness, causes her to become an adulteress. And anyone who marries the divorced woman commits adultery. Again, you have heard that it was said to the people long ago, Do not break your oath, but keep the oaths you have made to the Lord. But I tell you, do not swear at all, either by heaven, for it is God's throne, or by the earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. Do not swear by your head, for you cannot make even one hair white or black. Simply let your yes be yes, and your no, no. Anything beyond this comes from the evil. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Join in confessing our Christian faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose from him from death. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We join in singing the hymn, Father of Glory to Thy Name. It is number 248 in the Lutheran hymnal. Please be seated.
grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Dear sisters and brothers in Christ Jesus, our Savior and Epiphany King. A family resource center once advertised a seminar for children entitled A Volcano in My Tummy. The program description read in part, this course will teach children how to handle their anger using the anger rules. Anger can then become a motivating force that will help them build healthy relationships and lead successful, happy lives. As a Christian, what do you think of this course's stated aim? Can anger be managed, even a harness to build healthy relationships and happy lives? Or, in our Gospel reading, does Jesus dismiss such anger management and instead teach anger banishment? Finding and living the right answer to this question won't just make you a person that others would like to, or that others will like even better, it will also determine with whom you spend eternity. But why should we care what Jesus says? That's what many of the religious leaders in Jesus' day thought. But listen to what Jesus says. You have heard that it was said to the people long ago, do not murder, and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you, that anyone who's angry with his brothers will be subject to judgment. Jesus' audience knew well the laws that God had given to Moses on Mount Sinai 1,500 years earlier. Those laws had been received with much trembling. For God had appeared in fire, smoke, and earthquake impressing upon the people that these were indeed the Ten Commandments, not Ten Suggestions. Now, on another mountain, as Jesus is delivering his sermon on the mount, the Son of God himself further defines these commands given to Moses. Jesus' pronouncements might not be accompanied by fire, smoke, and earthquake, but something much scarier awaits those who ignore Jesus and what he has to say. The permanent fire and smoke of hell. So, what does Jesus tell us today that's so important? He debunks the theory or the myth. If you just refrain from big sins like murder, then you're a pretty righteous person who God admires. The words of our text. Jesus gets to the heart of the matter quite literally. He explains sin starts not with the hands, but in the heart. <laughs> To be sure, strangling your brother with your bare hands is something that would invite God's judgment. But so is anger, even if it doesn't show its ugly face in a clenched fist. As the Apostle John put it, anyone who hates his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life in him. I haven't shared anything with you today that you haven't already heard, but don't tune me out. Jesus has more to say. He's 
desperate for you to know just how serious the sin of anger is. Again, anyone who says to his brother, Raka, is answerable to the Sanhedrin. But anyone who says, you fool, will be in danger of the fire of hell. Nobody seems to yet have discovered the meaning of the word raka in its precise meaning yet. One scholar thinks that it maybe was a filthy four-letter word that was just so bad, no polite writer would ever explain it. It's also been suggested Raqqa wasn't even really just, there wasn't really a word at all, but it was a sound of disdain that someone might make with accompanying gestures. Whatever its meaning, it was such an insult that you could be hauled before the Jewish council to be held accountable. On the other hand, yelling, you fool, seemed to be mild in comparison, humanly speaking, but in Jesus' full disclosure of the law, someone who calls a fellow Christian a fool is liable for the fire of hell. We might be too polite or perhaps too cowardly to call someone a fool, a moron, an idiot to their face, but if we're honest, we do have to admit that we have spoken these words, at least in our minds. If we're guilty of saying or thinking such things, even once, God treats it as seriously as the Secret Service will and when someone attempts to blow up a presidential motorcade. But how can you be angry and name calling, how can that be so bad? Didn't Jesus himself once call the Pharisees fools? Didn't he on two different occasions explode against the money changers in the temple? He did, but consider his motivation. Love. Well, Jesus called the Pharisees fools because anyone who veers away from God's word and the heaven that it offers is as foolish as someone who has a free dinner certificate to a five-star restaurant and would exchange it for one Krispy Kreme donut. Jesus wanted the Pharisees to ponder their foolishness for turning from God's word and to repent of it before it was too late. When Jesus drove out those money changers with a whip, he did so because he was concerned about what these money changers were doing to those who had come to worship them. They were distracting these worshipers from the one true God. Jesus was also concerned for the money changers themselves. He wanted them to wake up and realize that the temple offered a treasure far greater than any coins that they could try to extract from unfortunate worshipers. So, where does this leave us? Does he, Jesus teach anger management? or anger bench. Well, it depends on the motivation of your anger. If you're angry because your child embarrassed you, or your boss upset your weekend plans, or because someone took your parking spot, Jesus calls for anger banishment. That's because in each case, you're angry merely about the inconvenience that this may have caused you. You're angry because you want everyone, no matter who they are, to treat you as a king or a queen. But the reality is, Jesus has called you to be a servant. 
So, when your child messes up again, as a parent, you have the privilege of calmly teaching her the right way, the way of the Lord, even if it's the tenth time. If your boss needs you to work late, yes, it may be inconvenient and even seem unfair, but think of how Jesus is giving you the opportunity to put someone else's needs first, just as he did for you. On the other hand, if we were to read on the internet somebody disparaging our Savior and making fun of his followers, we ought to get hot. But now, we need to manage this righteous anger carefully. We need to identify the real enemy, Satan and his <clears throat> temptations, which prompt people to say foolish things about Jesus and his word. We should be angry about this, angry that Satan has once again fought against the very souls that Jesus claimed by dying for them. So what should we do? Well, we can pray for the person who wrote those words. We can pray that the Lord would change his heart. We can even pray that the Lord would use us to be the one to influence this. If the individual refuses, we can pray that God would uh, take action Trust in him to carry out his perfect justice. But in no way should we take cheap shots at this person and disparage their reputation. When we resort to such pettiness, the truth is we do it just to feel better about ourselves. Listen to what the Apostle Paul said. Get rid of all bitterness rage and anger, growling or brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Paul urges us to banish all anger that grows out of malice and evil intent. But the Bible never teaches that we don't have any reasons to be angry, because we do. People are inconsiderate and sometimes even purposefully say and do things to hurt us. The Bible never says to relax because such lights are no big deal. No, sin is a big deal. In fact, if we don't deal with these lights, they will eat away at us just as salt eats away at ice. So, how does God want us to deal with such sin? Again, the words of Paul. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. God wants you to forgive, just as you have been. Forgive. By extending forgiveness, you're giving up what Satan insists is your right to be angry. When you think that's too high a price to pay, consider the price our Heavenly Father made. He gave up His one and only Son for you. So here's the bottom line. Sinful anger must not continue to reside in the heart of a person who professes to rejoice in God's forgiveness. Just as no parent would let a rattlesnake make its nest in a baby's crib. In the same way, you can't harbor anger and at the same time profess faith in Jesus. It's that simple. And it's that serious. Remember, 
God never calls us to do anything that he hasn't equipped us to be able to handle. Having been filled with God's love, you can be confident that you too can extend forgiveness. In this way, you'll be following in the footsteps of your Savior who crossed the cross and hell to banish God's anger against us. May God give you the strength to root out and banish all sinful anger with the help of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Now may the peace and love of our God that pass beyond our understanding guard and protect our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus our Savior. Amen. Join in our hymn of response as we sing, Salvation unto us has come. Note we will sing the first six stanzas and stanza nine. It is number 555.
present our offerings to the Lord, and we join in singing our offertory, I invite you to please stand. Bless the, the, the 
emergency personnel who come to our aid in times of disaster and need. Give me your people a grateful heart, that we may honor you with the first fruits of our labors, bring you the tithes and offerings of our hands, and use wisely all that you entrust into our care. Guard us from self-absorption, gluttony, and other vices that prevent us from extending your bounty to those less fortunate. Give shelter to those who have none, food to those who are hungry, an honest work to the unemployed. Use your people to extend your ministry and lift us to the joy of sharing our daily bread, especially in these challenging winter days. Bless our gathering of soup and crackers and the food pantry of the Jackson Ministerial Alliance, that those in need in our community might see your light shine forth through your church. The Lord has made known his salvation. He has Gracious God, you are our life and our length of days. Sustain and strengthen those who suffer sickness and affliction, including Ethan, Clara, Roy, Alice, Brad, Diane, Paul, Pat, Pam, Carolyn, Debbie, Lloyd, Stephen, Karen, Danny, Dan, Bill, Loretta, Earl, Carolyn, Doug, Larry, all affected by health issues warfare, and disasters, and all whom we now mention in our hearts. Give your comfort to all who mourn in your promise of everlasting life in the face of death, give us the confidence that those who belong to Jesus, who have fed on his body and blood, the very medicine of immortality, will not be abandoned to the grave, but will be raised bodily on the day of his return. The Lord has made known his salvation. He has revealed his righteousness. And to him who is able and ready to supply all human needs, whose light shines forth in his epiphany, be all glory and honor forever and ever. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. Lord, look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. We close by singing, May we thy precepts, Lord, fulfill. It is number 698.